Okay, so we're here in Romans 1. So what we're going to do on Thursday nights is we're going to just have a Bible study. Uh, we're going to go through a book of the Bible every, every Thursday night. And I chose to start in Romans, um, not to be, you know, uh, controversial, but I just like the book of Romans. I've, I've liked the book of Romans for uh, several years, and I just think that it's, it's a very deep book, and there's a lot of good doctrine in the book of Romans that um, can help us as a, as a new church and as a growing church. So we're just going to go through the book of Romans, and not to disappoint you tonight, but I'm going to take two sermons to get through Romans 1 because there's, um, there's a lot in Romans 1, and I want to make sure that I um, properly um, get through um, all the things that I want to, to preach about in Romans 1. So we're going to get through about you know, verse 22 today, and then next Thursday we'll continue and we'll finish off Romans 1. So I have a main um, point that I want to give about the first part of Romans 1, but first, let's just do some introductory and let's go through the, uh, the um, beginning verses. You know, the greeting and salutation is really in verses 1 through 7. And in verse 1, Paul says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Now, this is a good segue because we're going to also talk about separation on Sunday morning. And then we're going to have a three-part series after Brother Stuckey preaches on the 8th. I'm going to have a three-part series about you know, separating your life in certain areas. I've identified three very specific areas that are very pertinent to the, the world and the society that we live in here that it's, that's an imperative that you separate yourself from if you want to live the successful Christian life. And especially if you want to raise children um, through this mess that we're dealing with out in our, in our country today. So notice how it says in verse number one that Paul was separated unto the gospel of God. Now, we, of course, we know the, the story about Paul on the road to Damascus and how he was blinded. But you have to remember, turn, to, turn your Bibles to Acts 20, 23. It, it's, it's important to remember who Paul was before he got saved. And in Acts 23, in, in verse number 6, just one book back is the book of Acts. Just a few pages back, you'll find Acts 23. Acts 23, in verse number 6, the Bible reads, But when Paul perceived that, one of, that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, and this is what I want you to focus on, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. So Paul was a, a, a high-up Pharisee before he became uh, before he became saved. And he was actually a Pharisee that was uh, a Jewish religious leader that was actually a leader in persecuting Christians. So Paul was separated from that unto the gospel. You know, maybe um, you're not, uh, you don't look at yourself as a Pharisee or somebody quite that wicked, but the point is you still need to be separated in your life. So I'm not really going to preach on separation tonight, but I just want to point that out that, you know, the best evangelist that has probably ever lived was considered himself to be separated unto the gospel. And of course we know um, much of the New Testament was written by Paul and you know he he'd committed the rest of his life up until his death um, just preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? In verse number 2, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7 while I'm reading verse, uh, verse number 2. Go to those, uh, those 1 and 2 books and First and Second Samuel are the first ones in the Old Testament. And Romans 1 and verse number 2 we continue and the Bible reads, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning, so he was separated under the gospel of God, and then in verse 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now this is just a, an interesting side note that I want to give you. Um, if you turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7 and go to verse number 13, I'll wait for everybody to get there, but this is very interesting because you know, the Bible says that Jesus Christ our Lord was made of the seed of David. There was a certain promise that was given to, to David. Um, the story goes that uh, David wanted to, he finished building his house and he wanted to build the house of the Lord. And the prophet Nathan came to him and said, you know what, you're not going to be able to build the house of the Lord. Um, your, your son is going to build it instead. And that's what we're going to read here in 2 Samuel chapter 7. But a very important promise was made to David after he was told this. And the Bible reads, in, starting in verse number 13, He shall build an house for my name. This is talking about Solomon, your son. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, 
I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men, but my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, who I put away, from, put away before thee. You remember, God basically killed Saul. He sent the Philistine army against Saul, and uh, I believe Saul was saved, um, but God killed him. I mean, so there's your chastisement from God right there. So God was just done with Saul, but he's saying that, you know, I'll chastise your son Solomon on this earth, but I won't, um, I, my mercy will not depart from him, from him. And in verse number 16, we see the promise, and thine house, talking to David, and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee, and thy, sh thy throne shall be established forever. So how could he have said that to David, that David's throne would be established forever. Well, if you look at what happened when Solomon, uh, Solomon's son Rehoboam lost the kingdom, and you had the split between Jeroboam and Rehoboam, you basically had the northern kingdom of Israel peeled off with Jeroboam, and then you had Rehoboam who took over the kingdom of Judah. Now, the amazing thing was that if you follow the history and the hierarchy of the dynasties of the northern kingdom of Israel, it is just insurrection after insurrection after insurrection. There's one family rules for a while, and then his whole family is judged by God using the next family, and his whole other family is wiped out. This happens like three times with the first three kings of, of the northern kingdom of Israel. So it's completely different dynasties is what I'm getting at. But if you, then if you look at the, the kingdom of Judah, which they had better kings, but there was plenty of wicked kings in the, in the kingdom of Judah as well, every single king is a line. It's father to son to father to son to father to son. And of course, that ends with, um, they went into Babylonian captivity, but that lineage was, was kept alive until the birth of who? Jesus Christ. And of course, Jesus Christ, he has that line back to David. Jesus Christ establishes David's kingdom forever. So you see that God kept the kingdom of Judah even though the kingdom did split, he kept the kingdom of Judah a direct with direct descendants of David as king, and then Jesus Christ takes it into eternity. So it fulfills this prophecy in verse number 16. So I just want to point that out. Now, if we look at uh, verse 4 through um, 7, there's one other detail I want to point out at the beginning. And declared to be the Son of God of power, according this was Jesus, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among, among all nations for his name, uh -huh, among whom you are also, call, also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now turn to Acts chapter 8. I just want to show you who the saints are tonight because there's a lot of um, confusion about who's, who's a saint and who's not a saint and who gets to decide who's a saint, um, especially if you, you know, had it grow up in a, in a Catholic home or a Catholic background. You know, the Catholic Church or the Pope or whoever gets to decide who they canonize or whatever uh, maybe a hundred years after this person died. But let's just look at what the Bible says because that's all we care about is what the Bible says because we're Baptists. And the Bible is our final authority. So go to Acts chapter 8. And look at verse number one. And we'll just see, I just want to show you how the Bible can define things for us. If we just, just look a little bit closer, the Bible will just define words for you. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, the Bible says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. This is talking about Saul, who was Paul before he was converted, and he was consenting unto the death of Stephen. Stephen has just been stoned. And it says, Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which is at Jerusalem. There was a great persecution against the church that was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered about through the regions of Judea, Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. So he made havoc of the church, which was consisted of what? Men and women that were members of the church. Okay, in where? In Jerusalem. Not the universal church, not the church on earth, 
not any of this garbage. It was a very specific church that he was persecuting. And then that's when he was actually headed to Damascus to do some more persecuting there, and because he was persecuting the church in Jerusalem at the time. Now in Acts chapter 9, just flip one chapter over, let's look at what the Bible says in Acts chapter 9 and verse number 13. In Acts chapter 9 and verse number 13, the Bible reads, Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man, this is talking about Paul or Saul, how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. So here we see the Bible basically just use the, these two words synonymously. The men and women of the church in Jerusalem and the saints at Jerusalem. So basically, folks, I mean, we could study the word saints throughout the entire New Testament. What you're going to find is that if you're saved tonight, you're a saint. So congratulations. I just canonized you all. So if you're saved, that's what the Bible is talking about as far as who the saints are. So don't let anyone throw you off. It's a very easy thing to prove from the Bible. Now, let's look at um, verses, starting in verse number 8. Let's look at um, a section in Romans 1 that is basically defining our responsibility to preach or our responsibility to proclaim the Word of God. And in verse number 8, the Bible reads, First I thank, this is back in Romans, First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the son, gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Paul was praying for a lot of people all the time. I mean, if you noticed in, in most of his salutations, he's, he's saying that I'm praying for you, I'm always praying for you. Paul is somebody who probably spent a lot of time every day in prayer. Um, it, it, you know, he's, he's always praying for people. That's just a good thing to do. Verse number 10, making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. Paul wanted to come to Rome um, his whole ministry. He never got there till the end, but he always wanted to get there and appeal to Caesar. In verse number 11, for I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you, even, even as among other Gentiles. So Paul was preaching to the Gentiles. He went all these missionary journeys all over to the Gentiles. He wanted to get to Rome as well. It's, it's a long ways. If you look at a map from where Jerusalem is and where Paul went on his missionary journeys, Rome is, is out there. I am a debtor, in verse 14, I'm a debtor to, to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you there in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So there it is. There's our responsibility to preach the gospel, even in Rome. And this was getting to be a time when Rome was getting less and less um, tolerant of Christianity. Um, starting in 64 AD, when you know, Nero took over in Rome, that's when the Roman persecution really started. And there was 10 main Roman persecutions that was much worse than what they went through when they were getting persecuted by the Jews. So basically, if you want to look at the history of persecution up for the first few hundred years, you have the Jews persecuted the Christians heavily in the Roman Empire up to about 64, 70 AD. And then Nero started, the, there was 10 main um, Roman persecutions. And the Roman persecutions were absolutely brutal. They were trying to exterminate the Christians. But, you know, if you want to get people fired up for the gospel, you want to get Baptists fired up for the gospel, start persecuting them. Start killing them. You know, that's, that's you can't wipe this thing out. So, what I want to get, and after that, of course, you know, in 313 or whatever it was, that's when you have the uh, Constantine establishing the Roman Catholic Church, and then the persecution really started, because the Catholics were, um, were very brutal in the persecution of people who were still holding to biblical beliefs, okay? Now, why this push to reach the Gentiles? This is kind of my, my point I want to get to on the first half of, of Romans chapter 1, and if we start reading in verse number 18, we're going to see that 
The reason that Paul and the other uh, apostles went out and were pushing to the Gentiles, because what you're going to see is that there is no excuse for not believing the gospel, for not believing in God, and then also not seeking the truth of Jesus Christ. Okay? So that's what we're going to see in verse number 18. Paul is going to explain why I have to come there, why we have to reach these people, because there's no excuse for them. All right? They're, they're going to be just as damned as somebody who, who grew up a Jew in that time or was a religious person. Okay? Now, in verse number 18, the Bible says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may, may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it to them. Now, don't miss this in verse number 20. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are what? They are without excuse. Look, what the Bible is saying here is that the proof of God is in this creation that we were all living in. Okay, We are all here. We are all living in the same creation. Now look, even before I was saved, I'd been a I've been a Bible-believing creationist my whole life. Okay, and I believe from the top of my head to the bottom of my toes that if you do not believe the Bible, you cannot be saved. And what you will find, what you will find is that if you believe, you find, and I'm not talking about somebody who just gets saved at their door and they just don't know anything about the Bible. And they have a, a public school education, and they believe in evolution, and they believe in the Big Bang, and all this, because that's what they've been told their whole life, and then they get saved. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is going up to someone and showing them the Bible, and they say, yeah, I don't believe that God created the world in, in six days. I've met several of these people. I don't believe, I believe the earth is billions of years old, or whatever it is now. I don't know. It changes by hundreds of millions of years all the time, it seems. But I do not believe that you can hold that belief that certain parts of the Bible is true and certain aren't and be saved. It's the, Jesus is the Word become flesh. Period. So if you get somebody saved and they're truly saved, when you show them these things, they're going to believe it. Because they have the Holy Spirit in them. They've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. They're going to believe what the Bible says if they're saved. Right? Now what you're going to find, now here's the beauty of it. This has my, been my experience. Giving the gospel to somebody who thinks um, that uh, you know, they, they believe in Darwinism and all this kind of stuff, there will be something about the gospel that they will not accept. You mark my words. Isn't it funny how it works that way? But it, there will be, you will go through the gospel. With, I, I just did this six months ago. There was a guy, he was this super smart intellectual guy, and he, he, just, he just loved f f you know, philosophy and all these things, talking about... Um, you know, all these different theories of where we came from. But he was a Christian. He was a Christian. So I was, I was bored one day, and I just got out my Bible, and I said, hey, let, let me just, do you, but do you actually know if you're going to heaven? And he's like, all right, show me what you got. So I showed him, and there's parts of the gospel that he won't believe. He just won't believe it. And usually it's eternal security. Because somebody like that, um, you know, they're, they're not humble enough to believe that somebody else did everything for them. So, but there will be something that they won't believe. So it's not like they're just going to accept the gospel and then not believe. You know, God doesn't do that to us. It's funny how he just makes it so they won't believe certain parts of the Bible. Now, the proof of God is in creation. I've always believed in creation. And frankly, it's clearly seen in the world around us. I often told Garrett, you know, when we were, when I, we were growing, or when he was growing up on the farm, that I often told Garrett that it's much easier for people that grow up in the country to believe in God than it is for people to grow up in the city. And I know you're all from the city. But think about it. You're surrounded in the country. You're surrounded by things God made. And in the city, you're surrounded by things man has made. Right? So too many people live in the, the, the concrete jungle. They don't get to see the systems and the, the things that God has created. I remember one of my favorite things, we used to raise sheep. One of my favorite things, the last the last spring that we were on the farm, we had 180 lambs. 180 little tiny lambs, about 8 pounds running around. And one of the things that I loved seeing was when we went to feed their mothers every day, we would go give the mothers grain. And most of the mothers had twins, because sheep have twins. And 
so there's 180 lambs, and when we would go feed the mother's grain, all the moms would leave their babies, and the babies would just gang up in this little mob, and they would run around like little kids, and, and just run around. We called it the lamb gang. They would run around the, the feedlot up and down and up and down. But as soon as all the grain was gone, the moms would turn 180 lambs. They all looked the same, every single one of them. And then they just start, the moms turn around and they start yelling and the, the babies start yelling. It sounds, it's chaos. But within three or four minutes, every single mom has their own lamb back, right by their side. Just because they can hear the sound of their lamb's voice and they can smell their, their sound. How many of you moms, when your kid, when your child falls behind the back door, you, you know that that's my child? God gave you that. You know, that's proof of creation. That's proof. I mean, these things don't happen by accident. So, you know, that's just a small example. But one, one thing that I like about the Bible is that the Bible documents so much, so much science. And, and there's, it never gets credit for any of it. Turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I could talk about creation for several hours. So, uh, I, I, just, I just love the topic. The Bible talks so much about it. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, which of course was written by uh, King Solomon, which was some, you know, 1,500 years before Christ, so that's about 3,500 years ago or so. Look at uh, verse number 7. First of all, let me, let me just say this. This water cycle, water's a big deal in California, right? You know, um, the farmers fight with the people in the city because the people in the city want the water, and the, you know, it's this big debate on who gets all this water from the mountains, right? But think about the water cycle. If you go and you look up in an encyclopedia or Google or whatever, the, the internet's going to tell you or an encyclopedia is going to tell you that the water cycle was discovered in the 1400s or the 1500s, somewhere around that time. Okay, by water cycle I mean the, you know, that the rivers flow into the ocean and then it evaporates into the clouds and then it rains either on the fields or up in the mountains and then it repeats again, right? Turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 1 if you're there, and look at verse number 7. And the Bible says in verse number 7, All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Sounds like Solomon, or God, told Solomon how the water cycle worked. And we can get even more specific if you go to the book of Job. Open your Bible right in the center, in the book of Psalm. And go to the one book back and you'll be in the book of Job. Look at Job 36. Job 36. Job 36 and verse 27, the Bible says, For he maketh small the drops of water. They pour down rain according to the vapor thereof. The vapor is the, is the evaporation of the water into the clouds. Which the clouds do drop, and look at this word, distill upon man abundantly. You know what distill means? Distill means purify. So God is telling you here that, first of all, the Bible documented the, the water cycle. God created the water cycle, period. You know, when you look at um, water treatment plants are a real big deal as well in California, treating water, you know, taking the water that's been used and cleaning it up. Guess what um, two of the main... Um, ways they purify water and water, commercial water treatment plants, gravel filtration and UV light disinfection. Well, guess what the rivers in the mountains do? That's God's gravel filter. And the rivers are shallow. When you get to the top of the mountains, they're shallow and they're clear. Who knows what I'm talking about? They're shallow and they're clear so that UV light can shine right through there and disinfect and kill any microorganisms that's in the that's in the water. So by the time it gets down to you in the valley, it's clean. So that cycle just repeats itself again and again and again. Now, I have an object lesson here. I love water. I love talking about water. I could talk about water for several hours too. I need something to hold this here. So this glass of water, did you know that this is probably the most amazing substance on the planet. 60% of your body is made of water. If you go three or four days without water, you'll die. It's, you, you need it that, that badly. 
The one thing about water that I like the most is that water, this liquid right here, has the highest, what we call specific heat on the planet of any liquid. Meaning that that water can hold heat better than any other liquid that we can make. Now think about this for a second. How many of you have seen all the refineries that you drive by and all the chemical plants? Do you know the amazing materials that man can make? We can make Kevlar, we can make nanotube fibers, we can make all these um, refined chemicals that can do all these amazing things, yet if we want to create a liquid, we can't create a liquid that can hold thermal energy better than that glass of water. Anything that I add to that water makes its ability to hold thermal energy worse. No one can, did you know that 95% of your electricity because of this fact is created using water as the working fluid? That's why. I have a book at home, it's called Steam, and it's all about adding heat to water. That's what the book is. The book is 1,200 pages long. It's in its 50th edition. You know what that means? That means that we still don't understand that glass of water. It's in its 50th revision. We still don't understand what that liquid can do completely. All the graphs and the calculations and all this, we're still revising that book. I don't understand all that book. No one, under, no one person understands that, that book even as it's written. When you go out soul winning on Saturday, it's going to be hot, right? Because of this water's ability to hold heat, you're going to sweat. And then when the wind comes up, you, all of a sudden you're going to feel cool. You know why that is? Because that water that beat it up on your arm, as it evaporates, it's taking that heat away from you. It's pulling that heat off your body, and it's cooling your body. Who designed that? I mean, that's amazing. That's evaporative cooling is what that is. If I would take, I mean, we could have an object lesson. I could take this bottle or this glass of water. I could throw it in Brother Ryan's face, and he's sitting under that ceiling fan. In about two or three minutes, he's going to start getting a little chilly, right? But I'm not going to do that. Look, folks, you have to be blind to not notice these things. And it's not necessarily blindness. I'm going to show you what it is that makes people not able to notice these things. Last thing about water. Who's ever jumped into a lake? Where's the coldest water in a lake? Brother Ryan, where's the coldest water in a lake when you jump in? At the bottom. Okay? Something funny happens in a lake when it gets really cold. I'm from North Dakota. We go ice fishing. We drive on lakes and we drill a hole through the ice and we drop a line and we fish. The fish live in the frozen lake all winter long. Do you think the fish could live in a lake if the lake froze from the bottom up and they couldn't, see the, they couldn't get to the, the food on the bottom? Because most fish eat off the bottom, right? Something funny happens in a lake when it drops below 39 degrees and it heads towards freezing and we get what's called temperature inversion in the cold water comes to the top and the warm water goes to the bottom. I've always said that's proof of God, just that one thing right there. Because no, no marine life could live if lakes fro it just kept their temperature cold to hot. They would freeze from the bottom up and then we would never have any fish in cold climates. It's beautiful. You have to be blind to not notice it. Now, why don't people recognize this, right? You and I were sitting, I mean, we could go on and on and on. We just talked about a glass of water. Why don't people recognize this? Well, the answer is in verse number 21. In verse number 21. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 21. And the Bible reads, Because that when they knew God... They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And then in verse number 22, we see the real answer. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now, you can see proof of this 
It's, it's vanity. It's pride. Academia and science today has become filled with prideful, arrogant people. Right. And they do not acknowledge God. And God has turned them into fools. Man. And I'm telling you, in the last hundred years, you can see this plain as day. You can see this plain as day. You look at men, look, nobody, nobody argues that Einstein or Stephen Hawking had IQs of 160. That they had some engines up here that were, that were gifts from God. You know, I'm sure they could do math faster than me, or you, or whatever. But the point is, they never produced anything. Did you know? that Einstein, the thing that Einstein is known the most for, the theory of relativity, has produced no machine. Not one. Einstein had nothing to do with atomic energy. He had nothing to do with the atomic bomb. All these things he gets credit for, he had nothing to do with them. Engineers built all those things. Chemical engineers, other, other people. He had nothing to do with it. They just theorized and they just, it was vanity and just theorizing and, and, and doing things that work on paper. But if you look back at, at, at the, you know, 150 years back when men still believed in God, and I'm not saying that all these scientists were saved. Um, I believe Michael Faraday was maybe saved. But if you looked at them, they were steeped in experimentation. You know, men like James Maxwell, Michael Faraday, even Isaac Newton, they were steeped in experimenting things. And if things didn't work, they tried something different. They weren't so hung up with their own selfishness that they didn't even, you know, they just theorized all day long. I mean, uh, Michael Faraday actually turned down like every single title that he was given. He was voting into all these societies and then they wanted him to be president. He would constantly turn it down because he just wanted to study his and do his experiments. And because of him, you know, we have lights and transformers and, and electric motors. All these things. Look, all we're trying to do, all these men were trying to do is unlock what God already had put there. All they're trying to do is just create some machines that work together with the laws that God created. That's it. And their humbleness is what made them, you know, I believe God unlocked those things because they were humble. And because they acknowledged Him. Now, men like, you know, Stephen Hawking spent his entire life searching for dark matter and theorizing on multiple universes and multiple I mean I'm talking multiple realities I mean it's crazy I mean it's crazy he spent this man spent his whole life he actually went to his death believing that every look brother Richard every single possibility of anything that I could do right now like me walking up and grabbing you by the shirt me going over to brother Angel and grabbing him by the shirt me running out of here like a crazy person every single one of those things exists in its own universe, in its own multiple dimension. That's what he believed. He stood up in colleges and universities and he taught this. And people who are also vanity, you know, filled with vain imaginations, they worship this man. It's, cra it's crazy to think about it. It's crazy. Thank God that we're saved. Look, I believe that the proof of a scientist is the same, it, uh, as far as his merit, is the same as the proof of a uh, of a false prophet. You shall know them by their fruits. You know, could we have gotten Stephen Hawking to invent uh, a more efficient lawnmower, please? That would have been better. <laughs> right? Amen. Instead, it was just a complete waste. Right? Now, scientists today, and I've, I've listened to this preaching for the last 10, 10 years, scientists today, turn to Genesis 8. I'm going to solve this one for you right now, and then we're going to move on. Scientists today, all you hear about is global warming. Global warming, global warming, and then it gets cold, and they're like, climate change. You know? I'm going to disprove global warming for you right now, straight from the Bible. Genesis 8.22, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night, shall not cease. God will end it. It will not be us. Okay? I'm not for throwing trash all over. You know, I like to have, you know, clean air to breathe and all that stuff. But you know what? That we're going to destroy the earth and everyone's going to get flooded because of a coal-fired power plant in Montana is ridiculous. And it's not true. All right? Now, I'm going to steal something. So here's the first thing that we have. We have no excuse. 
Men have no excuse. That's why Paul was going to the Gentiles. That's why they're all going out to the Gentiles because they're going to hell just like everybody else unless they get saved. Okay? Now, the first thing that I want to point out to you tonight is because, you know, we're all living in the same creation. Just because the Gentiles didn't grow up in a Jewish home, they're living in the same creation that the Jew was. Okay? Now, the second thing I want to steal from Romans chapter 2, and I want to give you the second reason tonight that we're without excuse as men on this earth. And if you look at Romans chapter 2 and verse 14, the Bible reads, For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing each other. We all have a conscience. Whether or not you're saved, we all have this, we're all born with the same conscience. You have to get rid of that conscience. You have to do something where you deny and sear that conscience, but God gives it to every man. We all start with that. So, we have, there's no excuse for anyone. We all have proof of God through creation, and we all have the law written in our hearts. So there's no excuse for any of us. Okay, now look. There's, there's some more blessed than others, of course. And the Bible teaches this. All right? If you grow, grew up in a Baptist home and your dad was constantly preaching the Bible to you, you have a serious advantage over somebody who grew up in, you know, Norway or wherever, who never even heard of God. But the bottom line is, we all have those two things. And if you look at Romans 3 and verse 1 through 4, we see that the Jews had an advantage. The Jews had an advantage. The Bible says in Romans 3, verses 1, 1 and 2, what advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? He's saying, what good was it, if the Gentiles can get saved too, what good was it to be, was it to be a Jew? That's what he's saying. What, what advantage did they have? Much every way chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. They had the Bible. That's what they had. That's a pretty big advantage. Right? They had the Bible. And you'll notice that when you're reading people believing on Jesus in the Gospels, you'll notice that they already knew that there was a Messiah coming. Look at the woman at the well. Jesus didn't have to say too much to her because she knew there was a Messiah coming. All he said was, hey, it's me. Right? She already knew that a Messiah was coming. All she had to do was believe on that, and she was saved. That's it. So that's a pretty big advantage, folks. Now, in the same way also, there's people who ha are, are cursed. All right? You don't have to turn there, but just let me read you Exodus 20 and verse number 5. You know, read the Old Testament, and many people in the Old Testament cursed future generations. All right? that, in, in Exodus 20 and verse 5, the Bible says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. We're going to look at this a little bit on Sunday morning. I'm going to tell you a story on Sunday morning that to me is one of the most fascinating stories in the Bible about somebody who was a terrible curse on his family. Now, this isn't saying that those generations, you know, it's impossible for them to get saved because they, they start with those two things. But the odds are, if you're a drunken wife beater, that you're, you know, your, your children are going to be headed down the, the wrong path in life. The odd, you know, you're not really starting them off with a winning hand, right? So, look, you can be a blessing and you can be a curse on future generations. So, for those two reasons, you know, there's no excuse. Now, we're going to pick this up um, next week and we're going to see what happens when these people that have no excuse take it a step further. They get vain. That's the first thing. The first thing is they get prideful. And then they take it a step further. Okay, and before, uh, before you leave tonight, we actually went to um, the beach on Tuesday and we picked up some gifts for everybody. And what I have here, you all are from California, you've probably seen this, but this is a sand dollar. Right? And I remember in uh, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, we went to the Creation Museum in, uh, it's, I think it's in Kentucky. And my favorite place to go in the Creation Museum was the bug room. I mean, forget the dinosaurs and all that stuff. I loved going in the bug room. They had these thousands of bugs, you know, on, with the pins on the boards. And you looked at all the elaborate patterns on all these bugs. And look, 
there's no reason for it. There's no reason for it other than an artist just being artistic. And if you look at these sand dollars, there's no reason for that other than an artist just practicing his art. So there's tons of, re of uh, examples of creation that we could talk about, but please um, pick one up. It, you know, Brother Frank, don't take them all. Let the kids get one, okay? But pick one up on your way out. It's just a, it's a great little, it's just a, I'm looking at it right now, and the funny thing about it is, I was looking at them earlier um, yesterday, none of them are exactly the same. They're, they're all a little bit different. Some of them have bolder lines, some of them have sharper curves on the pattern itself. It's pretty amazing. Okay, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, this creation, this created world um, that we live in. Um, we thank you for just the, the perfection of it all. You know, uh, help us always to be in awe of it, Lord. And even though we're, we're living right now in the middle of a city, you know, whenever we do get out and, and uh, get out in the outdoors, just help us notice these things and just appreciate you for um, this, this amazing earth and this system that you've built, Lord. And um, it's amazing. Um, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.